I haul junk away from hoarder homes. What I found at my last job made me quit. For most of my years, I've been dragged around by the twin steeds of addiction and crime, without a thought beyond my next fix. Then I got arrested. That was the wake-up call I needed. Once I was inside, I had to deal with my addiction with both therapy and forced sobriety. It wasn't easy. And during my lowest moment, vomiting into a prison toilet, I found something I thought I'd lost. Hope. Came out the other side of my stint healthier and ready to take my life in a new direction. Prison had been the tough love that I needed. I was ready for the free world again. I soon discovered the free world wasn't ready for me. Part of my release agreement was that I needed to find steady employment. Thought that sounded simple enough, but I had no idea how the cruel world, how cruel the world could be to anyone and everyone who colored outside of life's lines. Despite being capable, willing, and reformed, no one wanted to hire me. My parole officer told me not to stress because he knew a few people who might be able to help. He saw that I was trying and made a few phone calls. Hooked me up with Pete, a good man who owned a junk removal company named Movin' Buddies. Been out long, he asked when I sat with him. About a month. How'd the family take it? Don't have one to lean on anymore, I said. Part of the reason I ended up where I ended up, you know. I understand, Pete said. We all deal with grief in our own way. Most of these ways don't end in jail time, I said. No, they do not, but it brought you back from the dead and to my doorstep. I'd say that's a win-win. Less than two days later, Pete hired me, and I was ready to go. Despite the name, Moving Buddies was not a moving company in the traditional sense. It was a junk removal company that specialized in cleaning up evictions and hoarder homes. It was long, back-breaking work, but it kept me busy. I welcomed the distraction. Wasn't even the only former con on the team. My partner and driver, Devin Baker, or D as he liked to be called, had also done time in his past. We chatted about it the first day and it bonded us. Like me, he had gone in for armed robbery, but he'd received more time. Like me, he struggled once he got out. He took this job out of desperation too, but he said it saved his life. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, it sucks, he said. We drove to our new job. But it's better than fucking jail, you know? Plus, Pete's not a bad guy. Tight as a dolphin's asshole with money. But he gets the life because he'll cut you some slack. We're starting to think people like that don't exist. Nobody loves ex-cons, he said. Wait until you start up with the date naps. You're gonna really feel the hate then. I laughed. Who'd hate a cuddly teddy bear like you, D? He laughed. That's what I'm saying. But it's cold out there, brother. Ice cold. We were headed out to our gig for the day. Some old fart that had passed and left a mess for his kids. I hated hoarder homes because there was always some extra bullshit hidden in the piles. You could not imagine the smells. They stick with you hours after your shift. We found dead pets and living wild animals in some homes. Never a dull moment. We arrived and were greeted by an exhausted looking man in his late 40s the son of the dead guy, and told us what we already knew from the work order. I felt sympathy for him. He inherited one huge mess. Sorry about how it looks. Dad went, uh, well, crazy in the last few years. All he talked about was conspiracies and people out to get him, and, and, uh, he caught himself. He changed, you know? Then he let this place turn into this. Not unusual in our line of work, I said, trying to comfort him. Believe it or not, this isn't even the worst we've ever seen, D added. That seemed to ease the man's mind, and he left us to do our work. D sidled up to me as he left and nodded at the house. This is the worst fucking house I've ever seen. Easy. When we finally cracked the tomb seal, the full brunt of the smell hit us like the concussive wave of an atomic bomb. Potent combination of death, rotting food, and vomit stung our nostrils. D wasn't lying. This really was the worst ever. Let's have a smoke before we get hip deep in this shit, D said, pulling out his vape. Agreed, I said, pulling out my crinkled pack of Marlboro Reds and Naked Lady Bic. Those will kill you, man, D said, nodded at my pack of cigarettes. And those chemicals won't, I replied. Shit, he said, exhaling a massive puff of vapor. 
I didn't say all that now. We finished our smokes and steadied ourselves. Wiped Vapo Reb under our noses and opened the door. The entry was crammed with old garbage. The house had so many flies that I thought it might get yanked from its foundation and take to the skies. The old man may have died, but there was still some life left in this place yet. God damn, said D. How did the city not condemn this place? Maybe he knew people in high places. Should have met a garbage man, he said. Getting to work. Orders were the worst. What they all have in common, some sort of mental break that sets them on this course. Found it's often associated with some kind of loss. A job, a spouse, a child. They compensate for their loss by trying to save anything and everything that could be important or that they could use later. They never do. Thus you get home stuffed with towering monuments to our disposable culture. The hell? Dee said from a corner of the living room. Walked over to him and looked down at the ground where he was pointing. It's trash, I said. Under the bag, man. Moved the bag and nearly vomited. Near the bag were the remains of two very, very long dead cats. They looked like they had been dead for a an ancient. Under a few ancient garbage bags. Saw an ancient wrapper for a McDonald's and for a McDLT in one bag. They stopped selling that in the 90s. You didn't know those were cats? I know they're cats. Look at their backs. I did. And that's when I saw what looked like a bite mark on the remains. Something with razor-sharp teeth had chomped some of the spines away. You'd miss it if you'd quickly glanced at the remains, but when you looked at them, you'd clearly, clearly see the bite marks. What the hell is that? I asked. Looks like a lion bite, bro, he said, shaking up. If we find a lion in here, I'm gone, I joked. It may not be hungry, though, considering he seemed to have had recently had a snack. Shit's not even funny, D said. I had two cats, Scooby and Shaggy. My bad, I said. This old man put them there? D asked. This is some old ass garbage. Those are some old ass cats. Maybe whatever ate them dragged them there. Want me to remove them? He asked, but didn't wait for his response. As I went to bag up the cats, we heard something skitter on the floor behind us. We both turned around, and a few trash bags rolled off of a pile and spilled onto the floor. There's actually a fucking lion in here, I swear to God, I whispered to myself. Quiet, D said, as I was scanning the room. We both looked around for the source of the noise, but didn't see anything. I was about to say something when we heard more scrambling off to our left. I rushed over, moved away a few bags, and let out a terrified, high-pitched scream. After the initial shock, I started laughing. What? D asked. Reached down and pulled up a beat-up Jester doll buried in the stacks. The porcelain face had split down the metal at some point, and the left side was totally gone. The right side's painted face had worn away with time and exposure to garbage juice, but one unblinking eye stared out at us. Its long limbs hung toward the ground, hunched over like it had a bad back. Who would want this? I asked. Weird fucking hoarders. I heard the skittering again, and out of the corner of my eye saw a massive rat run from underneath some old cardboard boxes and back towards the bedrooms. I dropped the doll and chased after it, but it was gone before I could do anything. He shook his head. Be careful when we're grabbing shit, he said. Those things will take off the tip of your fingers. Grabbed the doll and propped it up on the pile of trash so it looked like it was sitting on a throne of garbage. I'll hire a jester to look out for us. It needs a name. What about Trashly? As soon as I said it, the doll's heavy limbs made it slump to the side. He left. Trashly already sleeping on the job. We went back to work. We set about clearing out the living room and kitchen before we moved on to the closets and pantries in those rooms. Closets were the worst part of a hoarder's home. They crammed closets full of the weirdest shit known to man. Once we pulled eight taxidermied animals out of a living room closet. It was a nativity scene. Baby Jesus was a stuffed dormouse. We played rock, paper, scissors, and D lost. He had one closet duty. I set back to clearing out the living room, leading towards the hallway, and let D get to work on the closet. D had moved out three garbage bags when I heard him yell and fall out of the closet. I ran over to him as he was scooting away from the closet door. He was genuinely spooked. I helped him up and asked him what happened. 
It took him a second to put his thoughts together. Something touched me. What? I swear to God, man, something reached out and touched my hand. It was probably... I said before he cut me off. Bitch, I know what a hand feels like. A fucking hand touched my arm. Okay, I said. Gonna let the bitch come and slide. My bad, man, he said, shaking his head. That shit ain't never fucking happened to me before. You got a flashlight? Let's take a look. In the truck, he said. I'll go grab it. He left, and I shook my head. I was working under the belief that he had touched a rat's tail or something. Rats love the stink of trash, but people tend to avoid it. The smell in this place would keep Oscar the Grouch at arm's length. From behind me, I heard the rats scrambling around. I went over to where I'd heard the noise, but didn't see anything. He came back into the house and saw me looking for the rat. Heard something? He asked. I think we may have a few friends watching us, I said, glancing through the garbage piles. Can I see that flashlight? He handed it to me, and I shined the beam into the sea of living room trash bags. Nothing jumped out at me, so I assumed the rats were adept at hiding from humans. Something did catch my eye, though. Trashly. The doll wasn't in the place where I'd left it. Maybe it had fallen during the closet panic and I hadn't noticed. So I pick up the doll again. It might have been our jester friend here, I said. But not the rats. I don't like that doll, Dee said. Reminds me of Poltergeist, the fucking clown thing, man. But that messed me up good. Maybe we should put a tracker on it, I joked. Dee didn't laugh. Good idea. He eyed something on the ground and grabbed it. Put this on it. Handed me an old cat collar with a little bell on it. Gave him a look, but he insisted. I dutifully put it around Trashley's neck and gave it a shake. The bell jingled, and D looked satisfied. Put Trashley back on the trash pile throne, and handed B D back the flashlight. Let's go see about your closet hand. Walked over and pulled the closet door back open. Hey, I said to the potential person in the closet, we're gonna empty that closet. You want to get out of here without the two of us stomping you, I'd leave now. But nothing happened. I wasn't surprised. It's not that I doubted D. If anything, the dude was honest to a fault. The story was so far-fetched, there's no way anyone could be in here. But still, D is honest. If he felt a hand, he might have felt a hand. You gonna feel around in there, or what? He asked me. I said, let's look. You gotta feel too, I felt. I didn't agree to that. I protested. Neither did I, but here we are, he said. Don't make me pull rank. I wasn't gonna win. The only thing left to do would be to stick my arm into the garbage closet, hoping that a phantom hand wouldn't grab my arm. What the fuck even was this job? He shined the light into the darkness. Two bags fell and split open on the floor. One was filled with maggots. Looked back at D. I'm sticking my hand in there. You're picking up the creepy crawlies. Fine, he said. Now come on, man. Let's do this. I sighed and reached into the closet. It's packed with smelly, disgusting garbage bags. The old owner also heaped in a bunch of raggedy blankets to fill the gaps between the bags. I slid my arm into a tar black opening and felt around in the darkness. How long do I need to feel around for a hand? Bro, just do me a solid, huh? I need to know I'm not crazy. Pushed my arm deeper into the hole and felt around the trash bags. I half expected Dee to laugh and tell me this was some elaborate prank he was pulling, but when I glanced back at him, he intently watched me. There was real fear in his eyes. A thing I didn't think I'd ever see out of him. I don't think my hand brushed against something long and pointy, like a finger. My eyes bugged open because Dee ran closer with a flashlight. You feel it, don't you? I did feel it. It was a hand. I reached out and found the wrist and pulled as hard as possible. All the bags around me started to roll, and before I knew it, my force sent me falling back on my ass. The rank garbage rained all over me, but I still held onto that arm. I pushed the bags off myself, maggots landing in my face and on my hair. I stood up. D dropped the flashlight and was doubled over with laughter. I looked down at my hand and saw why. I was holding an arm, but didn't belong to a man or some culture creature. It was a mannequin arm. Threw it down with disgust and shook all the creepy crawlies off me. He dropped to the floor, barely able to breathe. I was hot. This job was bad enough, and now this. 
You fucking know it was a mannequin arm? I swear, I swear I didn't, man, but that shit's funny as hell. He had this kind of laugh that can bring anyone around to join him. Not long after, I fell under the spell of his piped piper chuckles. I threw the arm at him and he caught it. He helped me off the ground and apologized between the laughs. I patted my back with the arm and started cracking up again. I hurled the arm across the room. That's when we heard Trashley's bells ringing. I looked up to where I'd left the jester, but it wasn't there anymore. Dee and I locked eyes. We both wanted to speak, but found our ability to do so gone, as if we had violated an agreement with Ursula, the sea witch. I heard the little bell jingling again, this time coming from one of the back rooms. How was all Dee could push out? Rats, I said. Asked to be rats. Why are the rats taking the doll? A loud boom came from the closet door behind us as it slammed shut. We both jumped, and when Dee's feet hit the ground, he sprinted out the front door. I wanted to join him, but I caught a shadow moving along the wall, leading to the kitchen, and turned to it. In my peripheral vision, it looked like something with long limbs was skulking into the kitchen. The bell started ringing again. It was still in the bedrooms. Hello? I called out. Nobody answered. I took a step toward the crowded hallway that led to the back rooms. Is anyone there? This time, there was the sound of something moving in the kitchen. Unlike the quick skittering that we had heard previously, this was someone moving slowly, deliberately, someone trying not to make any noise. They were either trying to hide from me or stalk me. Neither idea sparked joy. Bro, I'm sorry, Dee said, peering in from the front door. Didn't mean to run away like a little kid, man. Turned to him and put my fingers to my lips to shush him. He nodded and I pointed towards the kitchen. He wearily inched back into the house, whipping his head around to see if anything around him was out of the ordinary. Feeling assured he was safe, he crept in but kept the flashlight in his hand, cocked and ready to swing. The bell started dinging again in the back room. I pointed towards myself and then the back rooms. Dee nodded, but he wasn't going to join me back there. I wasn't even sure I could make my way back there as quietly as I wanted. There was a small path between the piles of trash, and I was too big for it. I was sure I'd make a racket cutting through, giving whoever was back there a fair warning that someone was coming. Regardless, I was going to try. As I took my first step, I heard something moving in the kitchen again. This time D saw the same shadow that I had. He mimed to me that he thought a man was in there. That he was going to head that way. I delayed my trip to the back bedrooms and hung back just in case he needed some help. Still, after the adrenaline of the moment passed, I had second thoughts about going to the back bedrooms alone. It seemed like the kind of decision a dumb character would make in a slasher movie. I may not be smart, but I'm not that dumb either. I quietly stepped toward the kitchen, flanking Dee as he approached. I heard the cabinet doors open and slam closed. There was more movement on the floor as well. It sounded like more than one rat. Then the strangest noise came out of there. The jingling of a bell. Someone threw a trash bag toward the living room as we stood there. Landed in a wet splat and spilled the rotten innards across the floor. The food in the bag was so old it had melted into a putrid black ooze. And it sprayed all over Dee's pants. You're about to get fucked up, Dee yelled. He rushed into the kitchen, flashlight held high, ready to crown the bag tosser. Ran behind him, believing a show of force might deter whoever was in there. When we entered the room, there wasn't a single person in sight. We saw two rats running along the counters, but no lanky-limbed person. Rats squealed, dove into the trash pile, and disappeared from our view. He looked over at me and shook his head. There was someone in here, man. Those damn rats didn't throw that bag. Can I help you, gentlemen? Came a voice from the door. Dee and I turned to see a nicely dressed middle-aged white guy standing there. His fake yet friendly smile was plastered on his face. It didn't present any immediate threat. This job you always get looky-loos who want to see how demented their neighbor had been. They rarely walk into the house, considering everything that had happened up to this point, the Pope could show up and we'd be leery. Can't be in here, man, Dee said. I'm always here, the man said. Well then, your streak ends today, Dee said, keeping calm. 
This is a job site now and isn't safe for the general public. Man started laughing. I'm not the general public. Do you know the man that lived here? I asked. In a sense, I watched him for years, the stranger said. He made many poor decisions. Strange man. Well, he's not even a person anymore, D said, his tone shifting. He's passed on and left us this shit to clean up. Since we're in control of this site, we can ask you to leave. You get hurt, we can get sued. If we get sued, I get fired. I get fired, my landlord kicks me out, and I have to live in my car. Since I'm not trying to live out of my car, you have to go, sir. You live off Baltimore Avenue, right? Dee's face dropped. He did live near there. How did this guy know that? He squared up and took a more aggressive posture. Who are you? Dee asked. You work with Peter. I know Pete, he said. But he's never met me. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, I said. You're speaking in riddles. Just tell us who you are and what you want. Before the man could speak, we heard Trashley's bell jingling again, this time coming from inside the kitchen, despite me having, ha having heard it in the back bedroom just minutes earlier. How did it get into the kitchen? He and I turned in back and saw a rat run across the floor with a cat collar around its neck. Is that the collar on Trashley? Yeah, he said. He heard the jingling as the rat dove into the sea of trash bags and disappeared from sight, and it went quiet again. Where's the doll? I asked. We returned to where the stranger had been standing, but he was gone. We went back towards the front door and saw it swinging on its hinges. I looked at Dean and shrugged. Weird as that dude was, he was gone now. Who the fuck was that? How did he know where I lived? Dee said. What the hell's going on, man? There was more jingling in the kitchen again turned away from the open front door and back to the noise. Dee and I entered the garbage stuff room and scanned for the bell's location. It rang a few more times, but stopped as suddenly as it started. I elbowed Dee in the ribs and nodded at the kitchen window. It's mostly covered with old shoe boxes and a ratty old curtain. But you could see shadows moving outside. I saw the stranger pass by the window heading towards the back door. He waited a beat. Then the door handle started shaking like he was trying to get in. The door must have been locked because he couldn't get it open. He was beginning to get frustrated. He yelled out, Hey man, you gotta get the fuck out now, okay? Man stopped, but didn't walk away. I still see him outside in the curtain. He, thoroughly annoyed at this point, marched through the trash and ripped open the curtain on the back door. But instead of seeing the man there, standing... He saw nothing but the waist-high grass in the backyard. What the hell? Dee mumbled and let go of the curtain. You could see the stranger's outline again when it swung back into place. I audibly gasped and Dee grabbed the curtain and yanked it away again. There was nothing but grass in the breeze. How? I said. Or Dee could respond when the cabinet door swung open and Trashley spilled out. The doll landed with a thud on the counter and he watched as the lifeless doll lay on the ugly formica and waited for it to move again. If it read our thoughts, the doll's left arm fell and dangled off the edge. That was enough to drive us both out of the kitchen. As we returned to the living room, the front door opened again. The stranger had come back. Dee walked up to him and got into the man's face. Ran over and put an arm on Dee's shoulder, but he shrugged me off. Who the hell are you, man, and what are you doing here? Came to check on the place and see if things were in order. You two seem to be the perfect men for the job. Pete send you? I asked. You know the guy that owned this place? He was one of the people we monitored. He was meddling with things beyond his control, and he paid for that curiosity. You killed him? No. He awakened something he shouldn't have. He paid for that decision. I came to witness this. Witness what? Maybe we should call Pete, I said. Get this straightened up. Didn't know dolls could stand like that, the dare stranger said, pointing toward the kitchen. Both snapped our heads back toward the kitchen and saw Trashley standing tall on its thin, spindly legs. It didn't move, but it was clear it had moved at some point. It was in a small pile on the counter when we saw it. Saw it. All energy in the house had changed into an unnatural direction, like seeing watch hands run backwards. These eyes were so wide I was afraid they'd pop out of his skull. 
He was gripping the flashlight so tight I thought he might shatter it. Drops of sweat formed on his bald head and rolled down his face. He wasn't a tiny man. I was worried these scares might cause his heart to stop. Confusion is too weak a word to describe what we felt in the moment. Befuddlement, maybe. But discovering there had been aliens on Earth this whole time, and your boss was one of them. As we stared, the stranger said, I think you now have a real mess on your hands. I think I'm about to beat your ass, Dee said, turning to confront the man but not finding him standing there. What the hell? Where did he go? There was a rumble of thunder, and it shook the whole house. He and I both ducked like something was going to fall on us. I felt the thunderclap's vibrations in my guts. I glanced at the windows and noticed the sun still peeking through the edges of the blackout curtains. There were no clouds overhead, and I realized the thunderclap didn't come from above us, but below. I opened my mouth to speak, but the words died in my throat when we heard something knocking inside the closet door. It was quiet initially, but each successive thump was louder than the last. Soon the knocks were so loud and so violent the doorknob rattled with each rap. I glanced back into the kitchen. The jester was gone. Either fallen behind some of the bags or I'd move away. Neither option made me feel too good. This thing could skulk through the trash without making a sound. It could sneak right up behind us without us knowing. I didn't know if it was violent, and I had no intention of finding out. But the thought nested in my brain and set up shop. D, the doll was gone. Man, fuck this place, he said, nodding towards the door. Let's get the hell out of here. Best idea I've heard today, I said, not heading towards the door. D got there first, and when he grabbed the handle, he let out a painful yelp. Didn't need to ask what happened because I had heard the sizzle. Pulled his hand back and the mark had already reddened and started to swell. What the hell, he said, blowing on his hand as if his breath would cure it. And knocking in the closet started up again. It was loud from the jump, but the noise that bothered me was hearing the doorknob turn and the closet door start to squeak open. I ran out of the vestibule and back into the living room to discover the jester hanging from the handle. His half-face was turned up into a crooked, cracked smile. D, I said, my voice trailing. He walked over to me. He saw a trash lay hanging from the door. All the blood ran from his face, turning to a pale white color. Hello? I offered to open the door. Nothing but silence was coming from the closet. I was happy for the silence. Loved every sweet second of it. Maybe it meant that all this hoodoo voodoo shit was over. We could get back to normal. It wasn't over. Closet door flew open, sending the jester doll flying into the kitchen and out of sight. I heard something breathing inside the darkness of the closet. Across the quiet living room, there was a movement in the trash piles. I looked over to see the mannequin hand flying through the air and back into the closet. We gotta go, I said. He slapped at the front door handle again, which was still red hot. He shook his head. Can't go this way. He burst into the back living room. Heard more rumbling from the closet, keeping a wide berth. He stayed away from the closet and eyed the back door in the kitchen. Before we could step in that direction, there was another bone-shaking thunderclap. This time, though, all the piles of trash from the back bedrooms flooded into the living room and created a wall of garbage blocking access to the whole back of the house. There was a growl from the closet, and we both looked over and saw that mannequin's hand reach out and grip the door frame. Whatever was in there had attached the arm to his body and was pulling into the living room. That was our signal to get the hell out. We turned to run, and all of the kitchen trash rushed forward, like the back room trash, the bags formed a wall trapping us inside the living room. There was another growl from the closet. A second arm reached out and grabbed the door frame. This arm looked organic, but not well. The flesh was gray and ripped. You could see muscles and bones as the arm flexed on the door. Fuck this, Dee said. He ran at the wall of trash blocking the kitchen and threw his massive frame into it like the Kool-Aid man. He burst through and landed with a thud on the filthy, disgusting floor. His plan worked. Even though he was covered in foul-smelling garbage juice and living in a nightmare, he turned back to me with a smile so wide you would have thought he'd just won the Powerball. The smile quickly faded 
from the top of the refrigerator. Trashly uncoiled like a spring and launched itself at D, an old rusty knife in its tiny hands. Landed with a chaotic thud but quickly scrambled to its feet and sunk the blade into D's calves. He screamed but the doll just kept slashing at his legs, blood pouring out of a dozen wounds and mixing with the rotten garbage juice on the floor. He tried grabbing the gesture but quickly jabbed the knife forward and cleaned through D's hand. Tried pulling the blade out but was stuck on the gristle and tendons. Leaped through the wall and landed on the slick floor like Bambi stepping on ice. Unlike the deer, though, I kept my balance. He screamed at me to help him, took one good step and booted Trashly right in the face, sending it violently flying across the room, landed against the stove like the ragdoll it was, and I heard his porcelain face crack even further. I reached down and pulled D up. He screamed in pain and blood was gushing from his wounds, but he knew enough to get to stepping. There was a roar from the closet, and I peeked over my shoulder long enough to see a set of bullhorns trying to wedge through the narrow closet door. We gotta move, I said. Shouldering Dee's weight under my own, he was struggling to walk, and the pain was exquisite. But to his credit, he was not letting the oozing wound slow him down. Convinced he would have just ripped that leg off at the knee and hobbled out the door if he must have. We got to the back door, and I slapped at the handle. Like the front door, it was hot as well looked around for anything to cover my hand and spied an old rag in a nearby trash bag. With my free hand, I ripped it open and grabbed the rag. It was wet and smelled like death, but I didn't care. I touched the rag to the handle, sizzled, and I could feel the intense heat on my skin. It worked well enough to try to open the door. Though the handle wouldn't turn, wouldn't even budge. I dropped the rag and tried to boot the door open, but all that did was send pain up my leg and back. I swore but it was drowned out by the crashing coming from the living room. I glanced back and saw the closet door frame being ripped from the walls. Look out, D! I yelled. I turned in time to see Trashley leaping through the air with a fork in its hands. It landed on my leg and sunk the fork's tines into the back of my knee. I screamed in pain and lost my footing, sending both D and I to the ground. I'd collapsed onto the doll and I could feel it jabbing my shoulders with the fork sat up and the jester leapt for my face. D, without hesitation, plucked the doll out of the air like he was snagging a line drive. In one fluid motion, he turned and hurled it hard against the stove. Again. I scrambled to my feet, my knees burning, tried to bash the door open. I hit it three times as hard as my body could handle, and all I did was damage my shoulder. I went to slam into it a fourth time when I felt D's hand grab the waist of my pants and yank me down. Landed hard on top of him, but he didn't mind. As I slammed into his chest, I turned to see Trashley grab the bottom of the stove with its stringy, felt arms and easily lift it off the ground. With the ease of an ace pitcher to hurling a fastball, the doll threw the stove in our direction. My old duck and cover drills came into practice. I covered my neck and head as the stove flew over our bodies. The stove slammed into the back door, cracking it in half and knocking it off its hinges. Daylight streamed in, and our salvation was a mere few feet away. We could see our way out to freedom, but it was just an oasis. The stove bounced off the wall, nicked my back, and landed square on Dee's right arm. Shattered under the weight, I let out a scream like a wounded wild animal. The way we were tangled up sent this painful hollering directly into my ear. He thrashed under me, trying to get away from the weight of the stove. I was only making the break worse. I rolled off of him, grabbed the stove, and pushed it off his mangled arm. I reached down and helped D up, but he could not barely move. I was afraid he was in shock, and if we lingered any longer, the thing pulling itself out of the closet would be out and after us. I didn't know what it had planned for us, but I didn't think it would invite us to a potluck or anything. I know it hurts, bro, but we have to go. And I smelled the gas, looked over to where the stove had been, saw the telltale wavy vision of leaking gas. At that moment, like divine inspiration, a plan came to me. I reached into my pocket and found my lighter. I can't move, D said. Just leave me, man. I told you I wasn't a bitch, I said. Give me twenty feet of hustle, and I can get us out of this mess. I showed him the lighter. He knew the plan. D nodded, gritted his teeth, and leaned his weight on me. He was in so much pain, but he bit his lip and moved. I spied an old paper towel roll and grabbed it in my free hand. 
Managed to help D get out of the house and walked him about 15 feet into the backyard. Placed him on the ground and grabbed his arm. Let out a whimper, but didn't want to slow me down. Take cover, I said. He scooted away. Headed back to the house, but he called my name. I turned and saw his painful, sweaty face. Toast these motherfuckers! He spat out. I nodded and headed back towards the house. I held the paper towel roll firmly and pulled it out my lighter. I didn't know how fast the gas would light, but I knew I wouldn't be able to dawdle. I also realized this might be the last thing I ever did, but I was okay with that decision. It was worth it if I could send these two things back to hell. When I got to the door, the smell of gas was strong. The entire house was an accelerant, and everything would light up like a city's 4th of July celebration. I stepped inside. It was surprisingly quiet. I looked over where the closet door had been, and only saw a massive hole in the wall. The thing had gotten out, but I didn't know where or how it was hiding. When I turned my attention back to the gas, I saw the jester. He was standing on the counter. As soon as I turned, it leaped at me. It ended on my neck and coiled its limbs around it like an anaconda. I struggled to breathe and fought with everything I had left in the tank. The jester's hands, previously soft and cotton-filled, now tipped with razor-sharp claws. It raked those Kruger-esque daggers across my face, and blood gushed from my wounds and dripped into my eyes, blurring my vision. I screamed and pulled as hard as I could, but this little monster was velcroed to my body. I dropped the lighter and paper towel roll in the struggle. That was a secondary concern. I needed to get free before attempting to light this place up. I felt the doll's legs growing as it tried to wrap up my arms. I was face to face with its blinking, drawn-on eye. It opened its mouth. Inside was row upon row of porcelain daggers. It lunged for my face to bite my cheek, but I held it off as best as I could. My arm, the arms around my neck started to tighten, and around the edges of my eyes the world began to dim. I was afraid I was done for. I felt my knees buckle and I fell onto my back. The black edges of the vision were starting to tunnel. I had seconds to do something or I'd be toast myself. I moved my thumbs under the jester's tightening arms and pushed with all my might. First it didn't budge, then I felt the pressure lessen and I could breathe again. Fuck you, I spat and funneled all my stored up anger and resentment and strength into pushing this little clingy bitch off of me. It snapped at my hands and caught my knuckles, but I kept going until its spindly arms were off my throat. I ripped the legs off my body and threw the jester right towards the gas leak. It crashed against the wall, its half-face shattering on impact. I searched around for my lighter and found it. I flicked a spark wheel so hard I feared it'd break. There were a few sparks, but nothing caught. I urged it on, taking a peek at where the monster was. As I looked up, I saw the jester's new face. The porcelain had broken away to reveal a red and black pulsating mass of muscle, blood, and gore that dripped from the wound. There was a bellow from the living room, and a massive creature that looked strikingly like a minotaur, albeit with one mannequin arm, came stomping into view. It must have sensed my presence because it roared again and charged at the wall. Walls shuddered and cracked but held for the time being. Knew it'd come down easy the next time it ran at the wall. I was running out of time. I pressed my thumb down hard on the spark wheel and gave it a skin-ripping spin. It worked. There was finally a dancing orange flame at the edge of the bick. I held it against the paper towel roll and waited for it to catch. The wait felt painstakingly long. It felt like it took years in my mind while only taking seconds in real life. The Minotaur bellowed again and slammed into the wall. Its massive head came straight through. I looked at the Jester, getting down in a crouch to leap at me again. My goddammit light! I screamed. The temperature finally hit 451 degrees, and the flame transferred from the lighter to the paper towel roll. I threw the roll at the Jester as it took to the air. The roll hit him, and the impact sent them both to the floor. And they landed right near the gas line. I managed to get about seven feet outside before the flame caught, and the gas sent the entire house sky high. My body was thrown like a rag doll twenty feet into the neighbor's backyard, landed on my shoulder with a sickening thud and blacked out. Hours later, I woke up in a hospital room. A dozen or so machines around me were beeping and keeping me going. Pain racked my entire body, and each breath was a world of discomfort I'd never been to before. But I was alive. 
Officially, the cause of the explosion was a gas leak. The fire department said it might have been leaking for years. It was hard to determine because of all the stuff crammed into the home. Dee was in the hospital for about two weeks before being released, whereas I was stuck for a few more weeks. The explosion had rocked my brain and gave me post-concussion symptoms. I shared a smoke outside on Dee's last day in the hospital. I talked about what happened and thought it best to be totally honest with everyone. This was mainly because we were sure everyone hadn't been honest with us, especially Pete. A stranger had name-dropped him specifically, and Pete acted very strangely in the explosion's aftermath. He was surprised we'd survived and asked a lot of odd questions, some of which seemed to suggest that he knew more than he was letting on. He has slyly started looking for a new job. I'll follow him when I get out. Counting down the days not only because I'm sick of hospital food, but also because I don't feel safe here. He keeps popping in and I swear I saw the stranger hanging around the lobby. But what really concerns me and makes me think I might not make it out of here is what happened last night. About three in the morning when everyone on the floor was sleeping, I heard a bell jingling down the corridor outside my room. When I went out to look I saw the shadow of a short and long-limbed person turn the corner and disappear.